thank you. And then Robin, can I have you advance to the next slide, please? Great. All right, everyone. So just a few housekeeping items in terms of our agenda. Um, I'll start off for the first about 10 minutes or so, providing you with an introduction to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and our actionable patient safety solution. And then we'll give Robin Betts, our expert presenter, um, 40 minutes to give her presentation. And then as Claire noted, we will have 10 minutes at the end for question and answer. So please be sure to list out your questions in the chat feature um, and we will always unmute you at the end so that you're able to speak up if you have questions. Next slide, please. Okay, so the Patient Safety Movement Foundation is really focused on fostering new efforts and building on existing patient safety programs through commitments to zero. So the Patient Safety Movement Foundation's mission is zero preventable deaths by 2020. Um, we go by 0x2020. Um, and we, we believe this is a very audacious mission and we understand that this is, but we truly believe that zero is the only acceptable goal to have because one preventable patient death is just too many. Next slide, please. Okay, so who can take action? So the Patient Safety Movement Foundation works with four main groups on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the first group you'll see here are hospitals and healthcare organizations. So we ask hospitals <clears throat> to make public commitments around initiatives or programs that they're working on in their hospitals and really what they're most proud of improving patient safety. Next slide, please. I mean, next. The second group we have committed partners. So these are key associations, societies, nonprofits, that join our foundation by signing what we call a commitment to action letter. And um, these are very customized letters where we spend a lot of time with different partners and with different focuses, and we outline action items of, in terms of how they can support the foundation. Um, all of these letters are publicly available on our website um, to view. Next bullet, please. Um, the third group, we have healthcare technology companies. So we encourage medical device companies to sign what we call our open data pledge. And this is really a one-page pledge um, promoting interoperability and data sharing. So really what we ask for um, is for healthcare leaders to sign this, and it states that they're willing to openly share the output that their devices or systems are purchased for without interference or charge. So we really just want that signature, whether it's a startup company, a big medical device company, to really take this promise that they will you know, promote data sharing and improve interoperability. Um, the last bullet, we have patients and families. So we really encourage patients and families to share their stories with us. And um, this could be a patient that has lived to tell their story and they really want to spread awareness of what really happened to them or a family advocate that may have unfortunately lost a loved one due to a medical error and they want to share that story with us as well. So we have over 60 written stories on our website and we also feature on an annual basis new film stories that can be found on our website and on our YouTube account. Next slide, please. So these are our actionable patient safety solutions. These are our 16 um, overarching challenges. There are 16 challenges and 31 solutions, and these are really our products. They're free of charge, and um, we don't charge for them, but these are really what we provide hospitals as self-assessment tools. And with the commitment side, it's an online commitment form that hospitals fill out and let's say, for example, they're working on a great initiative around improving culture of safety. We ask them to utilize our actionable patient safety solutions as a self-assessment tool so that hospitals can really go down the checklist and see what they're already working on, what they've completed, what they could use improvements on, and what they may not realize that they're not working on. So again, these are supposed to be used as self-assessment tools so that hospitals can really use them in their hospitals and really improve patient safety that way. So you will see in the blue boxes, those are the overarching challenges. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see under, for example, healthcare-associated infections, we have sub-challenges, hand hygiene, CAUTI, CLABSI, SSI, just a few examples. So again, we really know that hospitals are already doing the great work. Um, we just wanna be an additional avenue that hospitals can use to really shout the great work that they're doing through our network. Next slide, please. So this is our impact to date. Um, we started in 2012, so we've been around for about six years now. So you can see over the years, we've really improved in terms of how many hospitals have joined our network. 
Um, last year at our 2018 summit, and um, we were really happy to announce that we have 4,598 hospitals in our network. Next slide, please. And then this is really what we're most proud of as a foundation. Um, within these commitments that hospitals make, depending on whatever challenge they select, we ask hospitals to predict how many lives they believe to be saving through their work. So obviously, we've really improved throughout the years, but last year in 2018, we reported 81,533 lives were saved through the work made to the foundation. So this is really where um, we're really excited to have Robin Betts give her presentation today on metrics. Um, within our actionable patient safety solutions, we do provide suggested metrics to help hospitals report their live save numbers. Um, so this is really where we hope to have Robin give her presentation and have hospitals understand a little bit better where these metrics are coming from. So before we start, um, I would like to give a little bit of a background on Robin Betts. Um, she is the Vice President of Quality, Clinical Excellence, and Regulatory Services at Kaiser Foundation Hospitals and Health Plan in Northern California. Um, Robin is a leader in clinical innovation and the implementation of safety improvement initiatives and has dedicated her professional life to patient safety, quality, and high reliability systems to make lives better. She has had a distinguished 35-year healthcare career practicing as a nurse for 17 years. As Vice President for Quality, Clinical Effectiveness, and Regulatory Services for Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, Robin helps further advance Kaiser's nation-leading excellence in quality and patient safety and oversees health plan and hospital regulatory functions, including compliance, licensing, and member grievances. Prior to joining Kaiser Permanente, Rob Robin served as Assistant Vice President of Quality and Patient Safety for Intermountain Healthcare, a nonprofit health system of 22 hospitals 185 outpatient clinics, a medical group, and an affiliated health insurance company in Utah and Idaho. There, she set the vision for patient safety and quality in pursuit of, quality, of clinical and quality excellence. In 2013, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation awarded Robin with our Humanitarian Award that recognizes leaders from around the world who have made significant progress in saving lives from preventable medical harm. Robin also has a strong background in healthcare information technology she has spent almost two decades in clinical informatics and patient safety leadership positions. Robin is a board member of the International Patient Safety Movement Foundation and an advisory board member of the Weber State University Masters in Healthcare Administration program. She is also an adjunct professor at Weber State University in Utah, where she teaches quality and risk management in healthcare in its MHA program. So we're really excited to present Robin, and Robin, if you want to take the lead and give your presentation, we'd love that. Oh, thank you, Sarah. That was so kind of you and um, uh, uh, quite the details. Thanks for doing that. Um, it's of really course. a pleasure uh, to present uh, to you today. I've, like um, Sarah said, I've served on the board of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation since its second year. and. I really remain um, committed to their bold mission. I've also led the Metrics Integrity Workgroup since its inception in March of 2015. So I thought I'd share a little bit about this work group and our purpose and function, and then I'll expand on the topic of measurement strategy. Um, so as the, um, say I can kind of skip that, but. As the Patient Safety Movement Foundation was maturing, they expanded their mission to develop actionable patient safety solutions, or APPS for short, as we like to call them, to really help hospitals around the world have access to free and easy to understand instructions and checklists targeted at reducing medical harm, um, such as hospital-acquired conditions. So um, as they began to produce these APPS, and to better establish, uh, they wanted to better establish measurement standards to calculate lives spared harm and lives saved. So they felt it would help to have a team targeted at assisting work groups with proposing metrics for each of the apps. So I'll just kind of focus on uh, this part of our performance gap. However, we have done work uh, with an external organization to assess and consider an auditing process to validate the integrity of our commitment data. So uh, the Metric Integrity Workgroup was chartered uh, with the objective to drive the Patient Safety Movement Foundation's overall goal to reduce preventable death, 
to zero by 2020 by providing metric validation and integrity as the foundation as as the foundation um, well publicly reports results. So listed here are the responsibilities of our work group. I, I thought today I'd share with you the process by which the team makes recommendations regarding um, the sharing of metric specifications and methodologies within the apps, which supports how we calculate preventable harm. So uh, we started with conducting an extensive literature review to look at how other organizations are measuring harm. Uh, we also contacted committed organizations to obtain their measurement methodologies and really understand their approaches. And then we consolidated all of these findings together to evaluate and consider what's the best method for us. So uh, from all the methods, we identified two viable proposals. Uh, the first was to model somewhat after the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services um, which is here in the United States, where they did this um, this, this massive uh, national hospital initiative called the Hospital Engagement Networks, and the program um, was uh, targeted at reducing medical harm around 10 specific topics. And they published um, Live Spared Harm and Live Saved uh, around these 10 topics. The other was uh, to take a more generalized approach, identifying a way to measure all harm using multiple inputs from codified data, demographics, and maybe include risk adjustment in a standardized way. And the thinking here is that um, as you worked on reducing harm in any area, it would be reflected in this more global measure. So we took both of these approaches to the board and uh, they really felt that calculating lives saved associated with the specific improvement topics would better reflect the specific work of each commitment. So that's kind of the direction that we took. So with that in mind, um, our next steps was really to work with the apps groups to establish standard criteria for, for each app. Uh, we have provided, we did develop and provide this measurement criteria grid um, to really help our teams with identifying the best and most reliable data sources to consider as teams um, develop their measurement strategies. So this, this is just kind of good generalized um, information. The further you go to the right in, the, in your data meeting the criteria, the better um, or more, um, the better integrity you'll have around that data. And these, these uh, slides will be made available to you afterwards if you're interested in any of the information that you see um, on these slides. We have also established a process um, by which our apps work groups submit their proposals and then they're vetted by our metrics integrity work group for refinement and maybe even recommendations back to the group and then they refine and rework and then ultimately they're approved uh, by our committee before they're actually published and then now embedded in the um, commitment forms when you go to add a commitment uh, to, uh, to, as you join uh, or commit to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Uh, we've developed uh, measurement specifications for the the, the apps that are listed here. And this really makes it easier for hospitals to understand how they can measure progress and success. Sometimes um, it's hard for, the, for organizations to develop the measurement strategy and um, it depends on how um, large their organization is. Sometimes a, a smaller standalone hospital won't have the resources or data resources to help with um, specifications around measurement. So, I think that the apps really help provide clarity and direction around um, your uh, a proposed measurement strategy that you could use. So I thought now I would just um, kind of walk you through an example. So this is an example of, we'll walk through the, event, uh, the example of medical errors or adverse drug events. I'm not gonna read this, this is just the executive summary that you would see if you downloaded um, the, uh, the app, the app yourself. Um, 
But each measurement strategy includes numerator and denominator definitions, considerations for calculating direct and indirect impact, and then a measurement formula that you can use and plug your numbers into. We often include helpful notes, such as with, the exam with this example of adverse drug events, which helps facilities really target specific high-risk drug classes, as well as the consideration of a control or balance measure. So in this case, we want our hospitals to make sure that as they establish targets to reduce medical errors, that we don't have the negative effect of decreased reporting, such that false improvement is really a reflection of decreased detection because teams were more strongly incentivized to reduce medication errors rather than assure we had good integrity around reporting. So as a balance measure, it's recommended that you track all reportable uh, medication events so that near misses and low-level harm, as you hopefully decrease the severity of harm, are still captured so you continue to improve. Now, based on life spared harm, uh, we um, we have a ver where we have a verified metric, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation calculates lives saved uh, based on a verified mortality rate. So in a sense, it's estimating the mortality rate of those individuals that were spared harm uh, by, by your interventions. And so um, in the United States, and referencing the bottom of this page, there was a national initiative to reduce medical harm in 10 targeted areas, and I talked about that a few slides ago. So um, with the extensive data collection, they were able to provide mortality rates that we can, we can now use. So in this case, the mortality rate for an adverse drug event was included in, in that data set. So uh, the mortality rate is uh, 0 0.02. So 20 per 1,000 events. So that's the potential of um, fatality. All right. Um, so here's a list of those published mortality rates for various hospital-acquired conditions. Um, sometimes professional practice groups or other benchmarking organization will provide such measures. So you can look for other mortality rates. Some of our um, partners that we have um, some of other nonprofit partners that work with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation um, often have mortality rates that can inform um, how we measure as well. So we just look for any verified or validated mortality weight and incorporate that into our calculations or make it as a rec recommendation. And I, I, I will tell you, uh, when I switched to um, when I first started participating in the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, it was the first time that um, my organization, we published Life Spared Harm and Life Saved. And I, it had an incredible impact on our frontline um, providers and nurses and, and uh, clinicians that they could actually see. I, it's one thing to see a graph and it trending downward and variability going down. But it's another thing when you actually quantify and say, thank you for your work. You spared so many lives from harm and these many potential deaths within our hospital. And it just, it really made a difference. So we made a habit in our annual report, annual update that we shared in our organization. We included the metric lives spared harm and lives saved. And, and sent out a, a message of gratitude um, to our clinicians. I'm going to now just kind of switch gears and talk a little bit about um, um, measurement strategy. It's really a critical part of testing and implementing changes. Um, measures tell a team whether their cha the changes that they are making actually lead to improvement, so it really is a key element to any improvement model and should be part of your improvement toolkit, per se. So uh, that's why we provide measurement strategies and all of the actionable patient safety solutions um, available to all healthcare organizations around the world. Um, so in improvement work, 
the team should use a balanced set of measures. That includes outcome, process, and what we call balancing measures. Now, outcome measures really help teams and organizations kind of gauge their progress towards an ultimate clinical, financial, operational goal of the project. Uh, we listed a couple of examples here. Recently, uh, my organization, we've been working on helping our patients recover more safely and quickly after surgery. And so one of our outcome measures is reduced length of stay. So that's one of the outcome measures I'm tracking. Um, process measures help us understand if the steps or actions in our intervention or process are being performed as expected. Am I getting strict adoption of these behaviors that are proven to improve outcomes, right? So here are listed our few examples. However, if I go back to my early recovery after surgery project that I just mentioned, one of the process measures we are tracking is opioid use, and another one is early mobility. So we have those on um, a, a dashboard, that, an executive dashboard, so our leaders can see how they're performing um, down to the unit level. So these are key interventions that really contribute to um, expedited early recovery, and I want them adopted in, in, the, in, in my hospitals across my organization. And then we move to balance measures. Now, balance measures answer the question, are things, are changes designed to improve one part of the system causing new problems in other parts of the system? So one of the balance measures that we're tracking is 30-day readmission. So we want to make sure that as we strive to reduce that length of stay and, and get our patients on the road to early recovery that we're not discharging them too soon, that they're not set up for success when they get home. So that's a good example of, of a balanced measure. Um, I'm not sure. I think I went backwards. Okay. Um, quality performance measures are constructed in a variety of ways, including proportions or percentages, um, ratios, means, medians, and counts. And each approach really um, serves a purpose and is appropriate in specific circumstances. But whichever approach is used, the detailed specifications and inclusion and exclusion criteria are typically developed through a process of discussion with clinical experts and analysis of empirical data or really based on definitions provided through a standard. So the most common in healthcare are ratios and proportions or percentages. So I'll just kind of focus on those two types of measures. Some quality measures are constructed as ratio me measures in which the numerator cases may or may not be contained within the denominator. So for this ratio measure, for these ratio measures, um, the denominator is viewed as the best available proxy for the true population at risk because that population can't be enumerated. So for example, when calculating adverse, um, adverse drug events. It's often expressed as the number of patients that experienced a, medical, a medication error per 1,000 adjusted patient days. Now, not all the patients in the denominator received medication, but it serves as a best proxy for the entire population. So that's an example of that. Now, most quality measures are constructed as proportions or percentages where the denominator represents the number of persons, uh, for example, it re represents the number of persons uh, treated by a healthcare provider during a defined time period who were at risk of or eligible for the numerator event. So the numerator then represents the number of persons in the denominator who received the appropriate diagnostic test or treatment, or you could flip it and say, or the number of people who experienced an adverse outcome. So on the slide, I have an example, of, and it's uh, with post-op respiratory failure with surgery. The numerator is the number of patients that experienced a post-op respiratory failure, and it's a direct subset of the denominator of all surgical patients. So that's an example, and, and that's really used um, most commonly. So let's talk.
talk uh, a little bit about measurement specifications. Uh, a measure is made up of several components. So besides a title and description of what it is, it must also have a numerator and denominator, and then a den denominator exclusions. So the numerator is just a piece of the pie, per se. It is also called the measure focus. It describes the target process, condition, or event, or outcome expected for the targeted population. The denominator, or entire pie, defines the entire population being measured. It could be the whole population or a subset, but it's all inclusive of those involved in the, in the numerator. The de denominator exclusions help us determine which ingredients you want in your pie. For example, you may decide to remove nutmeg from your apple pie. The exclusion defined which members of this population should be removed from the denominator population before de determining if your numerator criteria was met. So this is more easily understood if we use an example. So for example, um, on the screen, I have 30-day mortality. The numerator is all the patients mm -hmm. who died within 30 days of admission, and then the denominator is all inpatient admissions. However, uh, we didn't want to include everyone, right? So for instance, it's not appropriate. It would be appropriate to exclude those admitted or discharged on hospice or comfort care, or maybe those individuals who left against medical advice and so didn't follow their, their course of treatment and they left on their own a course. So um, this is just an example of how you can clearly define who's included in your entire pie or entire population or denominator. We um, establish measurement uh, for each stage of a project life cycle. So, Proposed projects move into a pipeline to be prioritized. So this is when we're just kind of learning about what we want to do. Throughout the duration of a project, it's important to estimate the impact a project will have uh, on associated outcome measures. So you're going to propose what you think it will impact. Naturally, these estimates will have a high degree of uncertainty in the early phases because you're basing it on some literature review or assumptions, right? But as the project progresses through its life cycle, you should become more and more clear and confident in your prediction and exactly what measures you'll target to measure improvement once you're, once you're all the way into sustained mode. Um, the impact certainty range on the lower half of this slide, so, so down here I'll just talk a little bit about this and, and these various images. Uh, represents this progression of certainty. So as shown on, uh, on this graph, on the left, during that pipeline phase, managers should at, le should at least know what indicators their project will impact. So what's your dartboard, right? What's, what's included in my dartboard? Sorry about that. During the assess phase, predictions are simply expected um, to hit the dartboard. So, um, you're provided an impact certainty of a range of plus or minus 100%. So an example is an estimate of a 5% reduction in C. difficile during the pipeline phase is expected to result in an actual reduction of anywhere from zero to 10%. So by the time the project reaches spread, which is clear over here, uh, we should be much more concise and really hitting the bullseye with an impact certainty of, of um, plus or minus 5%. Those are just good guidelines to go by. When establishing your project, you can also use a measurement strategy tool such as this um, to select and define appropriate project performance metrics and targets and really provide guidance on how and where and by whom they will be gathered. Without a really robust uh, measurement strategy, stakeholders will really struggle to demonstrate a project's value and it's less likely the project will be continued, implemented, or sustained. So getting really clear on your measurement strategy um, and using a tool like this so that you have clear um, accountabilities around um, how this measure will be collected and reported is really important. 
Um, equally important is um, what makes a metric effective. So the truth is that metrics are only as valuable as you make them. So metrics require time, effort, and employee buy-in to live up to their high expectations. So um, in my organization, we use the following criteria when developing measures, um, really trying to hard, hard to make sure that they're easy to understand, that they're easy to measure, meaningful, et cetera. And you can see the criteria listed here. Um, I recently worked on a project where um, it was hard to forecast because we wanted to use an um, observed over expected model where um, our expectation is that we would um, adjust the measurements within our index measure so that every year um, we would adjust the targets within the measure, but we would, but the measure every year was a target of one, and so um, it was hard to it was hard to visualize externally if we were getting better. So we needed to change our methodology so that um, we could see how much better than one we were being year over year. So it's very interesting. Uh, we didn't we realized that when we designed our our um, index measure that we designed it in such a way it masked improvement from the visual eye, which isn't very motivating for um, frontline um, providers who are doing really hard work to make things better. Sorry about that, I had to click. Okay, so uh, once you have your metric and specifications defined, you're ready now to set targets based on your current performance and where you wanna go. So it's really important that your goals are smart. Now, this is a very familiar concept, um, but yet I'm really often amazed at how often it fails to be applied, even within um, people who are, are uh, well-trained in quality improvement. Um, so um, goals should be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. And I just have an example. Um, of uh, actually goals that I've actually been given that show the difference. So uh, a non-SMART goal is on the left. Implement the central line bundle to reduce hospital central line associated bloodstream infection rates. Okay, that's all well and good, but it doesn't really hold me accountable to um, a specific target. So if you look on the other side, I want to reduce CLABSI by 25% from 1.0 standardized infection ratio to 0.75 standardized infection ratio by December 31st, 2019. So this is very specific, it's measurable, it's achievable, it's relevant to the organization's overall objectives and strategic goals, and it's time bound. So that's a good, uh, just a real simple example of that. And last of all, something I'm really big on is um, making uh, measurement visual. So metrics are really most impactful when they are visual to staff. So by establishing visual management systems and daily huddles into your frontline units and departments, staff will know if their efforts are leading to the outcomes that we seek. So by including both process and outcome measures, often called leading and lagging indicators, staff will be able to visually see if their efforts today to comply to best practice standards are really driving improvement um, of their over, overall outcome measures. And so um, this has just been, when, when we moved into having more robust visual management, it really changed the kind of vigilance and commitment that we had um, around improvement of all of our indicators. And then uh, this is really just a, a summary. We kind of covered the Patient Safety Movement Foundation um, our, uh, and our commitment to help organizations understand how they can measure and impact um, reducing medical harm and helping all of us get together by implementing the apps. And then we talked a little bit um, about measurement strategy. So um, that kind of uh, 
ends my presentation. Uh, you can only talk so much about measurement, and I was fearful it would uh, not be a very stimulating uh, activity, as uh, most people find it rather rather boring. But I appreciate your time, and I just wondered if you had any questions at this point, or if any questions came in. I'll let uh, I'll, I'll guess I'll turn it over to Sarah to kind of guide us through the Q and A session. Hey, thank you, Robin, and thank you so much for that informative presentation. Um, so I will go through and start off by reading any questions from the chat. So we have James Phillips um, asked, what was the R in SMART? Oh, it's, you want, I can go back to it, but it's, uh, it, let's see, SMART is, uh, oh, gosh, reliable, no, oh, relevant, yeah, it's relevant to your, organ, like, the objectives of your organization. So when I use the example here, um, it, it, looking at my organization, this aligns well with um, our strategic goals because one of our strategic goals and actually a goal that um, is tied to remuneration is reduction in hospital acquired infections. So this would be a very a, a relevant goal for my organization. Okay, I can go back. Thank you, Robin. Mm -hmm. So the question and answer session is now open. If you have questions, feel free to type them in our chat. Um, if you would like to be unmuted for any reason, please indicate in the chat feature as well, and we can have Claire unmute you specifically. No questions. Wow, that must mean, Robin, you answered everyone's questions. <laughs> Good. Well, um, what we'll do is we'll take everyone um, off the mute, and I'll see if anyone who's just connected to audio wants to ask a question. It might get a little noisy with all the feedback, so we'll just hold for a few minutes to see if anyone speaks up. Um, we might have a couple questions coming in, so before I do that, um, just so everyone knows, uh, the slides will be available on the website. Um, within 24 hours after this session. So by tomorrow morning, uh, there will be this link, the recording, and any supporting documents that Robin sends through. So um, just give us a moment to get that on uh, the website, please. Okay. And then I would unmute, um, you can scroll up real quick. I would unmute Kathy. Okay, and give us one minute, please. <laughs> Your I'm 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 I wanted to see if um, someone had a question. So we'll just uh, pull questions from the chat feature. So let me scroll up here. Give me a moment, please. Um, I just wanted to address one of the questions that was asked about the patient safety movement and how we compare to international efforts. Um, I don't know if I noted this earlier on in our little overview, but the Patient Safety Movement Foundation started off in 2012 in the United States. And since 2012, we've grown across 50 countries. Um, within the hospital commitments bucket alone, we have um, hospitals across 44 countries. And then if you combine all of the groups that I discussed earlier, the hospitals, the healthcare technology companies, all of our partners and patients and family advocates, we now spread across 50 countries. So we have great international efforts, um, and obviously we're really hoping to get as many countries involved in our movement to really share the great work that they're doing. Yeah. I think one of the key differences as well is um, there's, um, as, as hospitals, those that are active in reducing harm, there's no cost. Um, to membership, and so that's really helpful. And then we freely share um, uh, the actual patient safety solutions for organizations to, to grab and, and pull down and then incorporate. And then I think the commitment model is really unique. I mean, all, all they ask is that 
um, these different groups make a commitment. Instead of um, doing uh, just being a member of something, um, we actually commit to do something. And um, I think that makes the organization a much more actionable um, organization. Great. Thank you, Robin. And just kind of piggybacking off of that, I think something that really makes us unique as a foundation is we really just want to learn from one another across the world. So obviously we have a great presence across all of those 44 countries, but you know, a hospital, let's say in Taiwan, may really learn something um, from a, a hospital in the United States. So it's really a great opportunity to read through these commitments. Um, something that I don't think I noted earlier on is all of these commitments are publicly available on our website. So you can go on our website and review all of the commitments that have been made by committed hospitals and specifically read, you know, what their action plans are, what, what they're really implementing in those hospitals, and really, again, learning, um, in addition to what Robin talked about with the metrics and methodology, how other hospital organizations may be reporting life saved. So again, it's a great learning opportunity, and we would really encourage any hospital leaders on the phone today to make commitments around programs that you're already successfully working on and just using us as an additional platform to share all of the amazing work that you are doing. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition, we see another question. Can you offer any information on how many committed groups within the U.S. versus outside? Um, I can do that. Um, I'm happy to provide that in a separate email. Um, we do have those numbers split out, but I would have to you know, spend some time on the back end going through that. Mm -hmm. And then we have another question from Vonda Vaden Bates. Um, Robin, as a cultural change leader, what metrics do you find most motivating when looking at cultural change and engagement? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, I think the more that we can humanize the work, um, that that is more motivating. And so, um, I think when you convert the metrics into lives. Um, that, that makes it more meaningful for adoption because it makes it personal. I'm making a difference, I'm saving a life, and um, so, and, and including in our um, improvement work, it kind of sends the message, I'm not performing a critical task, I'm performing a human intervention that makes a difference in somebody's life. And so, um, it's just, and again, an opportunity to make it make it more personal. Thank you, Robin. Does anybody else have any questions that they'd like to add? <laughs> okay, so we have another question, Robin, from Adrian Chan. Um, what do we do if the quality metrics can't be compared to other hospitals? Yeah. Well, it's okay to have internal um, um, benchmarking where there isn't a more, a more broad substitute. Um, you know, the, the, only, um, the only negative to that is that, um, uh, you know, our I, I hate to say it, but sometimes I say, well, if we don't look outside ourselves, maybe maybe um, we're, we're the cream of the crap, right? So we're not as good as we think we are if we only look at ourselves. So anytime that you can use a measure that goes outside and compares you to a broader population is better, um, but where there isn't a substitute, it's fine to use an internal metric and then just strive for uh, higher reliability either in the process or improvement around that specific measure, whatever you're trying to strive for. Great. Thank you, Robin. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just wanted to go back um, to address the question that someone had about the split between U.S. hospitals versus international. So within those 4,598, we have a little bit more now, but that number is a surprise for our big summit in January. We have a little over 3,500 hospitals in the U.S., so I just wanted to address that to make sure that question was answered. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the chat? I thought I saw one come through, but I'm not sure. Okay. 
doesn't look like it. We'll give about one more minute um, for additional questions or comments. Okay, Robin, do you wanna to go to the next slide so we'll do our closing remarks? Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay, so just a few things. Um, one of the main things that we wanted to highlight is um, our big seventh annual World Patient Safety Science and Technology Summit um, is taking place here in Huntington Beach, California on January 18th and 19th of 2019. Um, again, we have two big events each year. This is our Keystone event, so we would really love anyone interested in attending. Um, registration is now open, um, and it's still open. It's been open for quite some time now, but if you go on our website, um, you can register directly through the link um, for our 2019 summit, um, and we really hope to see you attend. First-time hospital attendees um, are able to attend for a registration fee of $1,000. And obviously for partners already in our network, hospital leaders within our network, um, all of the registration prices are available to be seen on our website. So we really hope to see you guys there. Um, and then the next quarterly webinar will be taking place on March 13th, 2019. And it's around engineering and the future of healthcare, fundamentals of human factors and er ergonomics on Wednesday, March 13th. And we will have two expert presenters Kristen Miller and Sasha Byrne, who will be um, presenting on that topic. So just look out for that registration for um, the webinar. And again, we really hope to see you at our upcoming summit in January. Great. Thank you so much, Robin, for a great presentation. We hope that um, the information that you helped, I'm sure it was very helpful for the Patient Safety Movement Foundation team. So we hope that people can take the information that you gave and really reflect that in those commitments that we hopefully see to come through. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.